In this tutorial, we will answer the question, how do I connect a Postgres database to my React Native application by building a full stack e-commerce application using React Native, Express for the server, Drizzle for the ORM and Neon Postgres for the database. Hey everyone, what's up? This is Simon from galaxies.dev and in today's build, we're gonna tackle a massive project. This is going to be a full stack tutorial in which we, first of all, implement an express server using TypeScript. That express server will be connected to Neon database. So that is a Postgres database with branching and Neon is also the sponsor of this video. So go check out neon.tech. You can actually get started for free with the databases and they have generous tiers for setting up your project. We're gonna see how we can create our data databases and branches and use the CLI of Neon and just create an easy express API using Drizzle ORM which will allow us to not touch any SQL but just stay in TypeScript land. Then with that API ready we're gonna move into a React Native application that looks and works pretty epic. So this one will use React Navigation. We're gonna implement Zustand for state management which is like Redux but better. We're gonna use some animations, some cool styling and just go through the whole flow of building an e-commerce stop from getting the projects to the details to adding them to our card and finishing the checkout. As we have quite a lot of code, check out the link to GitHub below this video and also of course check out Neon and now without further ado, let's build an epic full stack e-commerce application. All right, so let's start today's adventure by implementing the backend. And for the backend, we're gonna use Neon, which is a serverless Postgres database that we can easily plug into our backend. However, of course, we need a little server to access the database. You don't wanna do that directly from your React Native app. So we're gonna do an express server. That is the easiest way to do it. And we will also use something called Drizzle. Yeah, um, I learned about Drizzle. I initially wanted to use something else, but Drizzle uh, sounds awesome. And you're gonna hear me say it many times during this uh, tutorial because Drizzle will help us to actually generate all the stuff related to SQL. So you don't really have to write your own SQL code in our tutorial and you're gonna see how. So Neon, Drizzle, Express, that's all we need. Let's get started by creating a new folder. I'm gonna call this server, that's perfect. I'm trying to <laughs> do the first comment and it's just immediately failing. Uh, okay, this is going to be a great day. Uh, let's do this. So open up your favorite IDE. In my case, it's of course Visual Studio Code. And I'm also gonna zoom in for you because I really like you. So let's do this drizzle zoom. And there we go. All right, to set up a server, um, I wanna use TypeScript. The sad truth is that I couldn't find like a good template to just create um, an express server with TypeScript. So we're gonna do it the standard way. Let's create a package JSON with npm in it. And then we're gonna install a bunch of packages that we will need. So we're gonna install express for our server, Postgres to connecting to the database, .env to load some variables, the drizzle ORM and also PG to uh, connect to our database. And we're then also gonna install some development dependencies in our application. So the types for Express, uh, for Node, we're gonna use TS Node to run some scripts. We're gonna use the types for PG and the Drizzle Kit as well, because that's actually the first thing we're gonna do. So right now we don't really have any kind of database and we have no place to connect to. So let's change this and then let's see how we can build up our database. So let's go to Neon. Uh, you can get started for free. So here I'm in my console. I'm gonna hit create project. I'm gonna call this um, shop, very creative, Simon. Uh, I'm gonna use Europe, Frankfurt. That's the closest to me and I'm gonna create this. So this already gives me my connection string. So I'm gonna copy this. This was actually unbelievable fast, <laughs> um, crazy. Let's do this. Let's create a new ENV file and put in my stuff. Um, I'm gonna make this available as, let's say, database URL. And I will also do something like port 3K because usually if you later host your um, backend somewhere, you're gonna need this as well. So this is my connection um, that I will use for this video. Now let's create a new folder source in which we're gonna do all the fun. And we're gonna also do another folder DB because I actually don't wanna 
implement the the express server i want to implement the drizzle schema so let's create a new file in here uh things always the same with visual studio so schema.ts and in here we're gonna define our tables so we're gonna have three tables we're gonna have um, a table products so let's say export const products that's going to be some kind of table uh, then we're gonna have tables let's say export const orders because for our shop we of course need to take orders and if you yeah usually we would also do something like users but we're going to do something else we're going to do order items because if we create the order we can't really have an array of products in the order that usually won't work so we're going to have different order items and because sql magic will happen uh we will make this happen now of course they're not going to be empty objects we're going to use drizzle now so what we can do is we can now create a table um oh yeah we haven't added typescript to our project maybe we should do that first uh let's touch uh, ts config dot json um and within that ts config we're gonna add the default settings so i don't know if they can be found somewhere um but again i couldn't initialize just an express server with typescript um in any other way so this is my uh, TS config now. Uh, on top of that, we can also check our package JSON. Uh, we're gonna add some scripts later here, but for now, uh, just make sure that you got all of this in place. I had some problems with Drizzle Kit, uh, so that's why I installed it at version 0.19. Perhaps this is fixed, so you can try and use the latest versions, of course. Um, I'm gonna also comment out these so they don't confuse us anymore. And then we can do uh the pg table which comes from uh, why am i not getting any auto import i would love to have that so import pg table from our drizzle uh or m slash pg so the connector for postgres core all right and now we can define a new table and the name for this table is of course products and then we follow this up with the different columns of that table so we define this here in typescript and drizzle will not only help us to later query the data from the sql table easily it will also help us to actually create them in the first place which is kind of mind-blowing to me so let me show you how we can do this. First of all, you would now define the different fields of your table. Let's say you have an ID, then you can use serial and primary key from Drizzle. Um, serial needs to get a value, so I'm gonna use ID. And then we can have all the other fields. So uh, product name, that could be a varchar um, using the name. And you can also usually pass in some more settings here. Like you could say this should have a length of, I don't know, 100. Don't need to have huge products. And you can also combine this and say not not. So there are really a lot of settings that you can have on your fields with Drizzle. Um, I played around with it for quite some time to figure out the right settings. Definitely check out the documentation and everything here. It's just really unbelievable how easy this later works. So let me bring in the different other fields for this as well. So we have a product category, a description, a price, um, the stock of this, and maybe an image stored in text. Let's add all missing imports. They all come from Drizzle ORM, and that is our products table. Now, we can do basically the same for the next table. So for the orders table, what we can do is just set it up in the pretty much same way. We have an ID. Uh, we're going to have a customer email. So we're going to do like a little fakey here. Uh, when we later do the order from the React Native application, we're just going to submit an email. Yes, in a real world example, you would have a users table and you would create users. But I want to boil this down really to the important part of the setup of the back end. Um, the connection to the database and the uh, exchange between backend and React Native application to make this a full stack example. So I'm going to keep it a bit uh, dummy like. Uh, nonetheless, we're going to have a total value of an order so we can see how much um, the order actually does cost. Now, finally, we need our um, order items. And this one is going to be a bit more challenging. The problem with this table is that it will reference the different other uh, tables we already have. So 
an order item will be part of an order and will also have a product. So therefore we have an order ID, which is going to be an integer uh, order ID, which is not null. And this also references, and now this is pretty cool, uh, orders dot ID. And because TypeScript, uh, we get the full type safety in these places. And we can of course do the same for the product ID now. So product ID, integer, not null, references, products, dot ID. And then we can have probably a quantity and a total of this one order item position. Um, finally, I will also make these available to the rest of our application uh, using export type product, order and order item. And we're gonna use them in our code later on. And that's all we need to do for our schema. That's the cool thing. And now the fun begins because what we want to do now is we want to use Drizzle Kit. So this was Drizzle uh, or M in terms of creating the tables and defining the different fields. Now we're going to use Drizzle Kit. So we're going to create a new file. I'm going to call this migrate.ts. Um, and we also need a little script. Let's let's update our package JSON. Um, so the scripts, I don't need the test script, but I want to have these. So for a general build, we'll just compile our TypeScript code. For dev, uh, we can start the index file, which we don't have, but we will eventually do this. Uh, to start it, we would use the compiled or the transpiled index.js. Um, to start in production mode, we will also do this. And now the important part is drizzle kit generate. So this one is what we can actually already run. Let's give this a try. I'm gonna hit save and npm run generate and see what happens. Um, nothing, <laughs> uh, no config path provided. So let's do this. That's actually a good error that we haven't created a drizzle config. Let's do this at the top level. Uh, drizzle dot uh, config dot ts. And within the drizzle config, we can define a few things. So we can define where our schema file is. So mine is under source db schema. And I wanna output the generated file to drizzle. And with that in place, let's run the command again. And now we should see a new folder, Drizzle, coming up here. So here we can find our changes, oops, on the database. Um, and this is the first one. Create table if not exist, order items. Create table if not exist, orders. Create table if not exist, products. And then we also alter our tables to include, can I break the line? Yes order items at constraints with a foreign key that references. So everything that we've just written from our TypeScript code in the schema file was translated into this nice looking SQL statements. And we can feed those statements to our database to create the actual tables. And of course, if you later want to change your uh, database, you could um, change the schema or change whatever you want and Drizzle would create um, the according changes, you, it wouldn't just um, like delete the tables and create them again. No, we would have the according change statements to just update our table. And that's what I really, really uh, liked about using Grizzle. And of course, the whole simplicity of just writing TypeScript to actually create the SQL code. So now, uh, as I said, we need to migrate our um, commands and we need to actually run them on the database. So therefore, uh, let's bring in a few imports. We're gonna add the config from .env. We're gonna import the migrate command here, Postgres and Drizzle. And now we can first of all check if we're running in production mode um, or if we're running in development mode. Um, so I'm actually gonna use different environments now. Let's say this is the dev uh, .dev .env. No, I don't need an extension for that. So that means in development mode, uh, we will load that config file. In production mode, I might load a different environment so we could easily switch between um, different um, endpoints for our database. Now we can extract the actual configuration so we can get the database URL from our process environment. Um, no, not database URL. Oh, let's just extract. Let's do this like the cool kits. Let's do it like this. This is cool, right? Um, and then we're going to do the connection. So the database URL 
is now using a Drizzle connection to our database URL. That's almost uh, correct. Now this complaint because this might not be said. Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure this is defined at some point. <laughs> so um, what's your problem with a database URL, my friend? Argument of type string is not assignable to... Yes, that's true. Uh, because we also need to wrap this with post Gress in here. That is the magic we need it. And then it looks like this. So then we have the right connection string to the database URL. However, we will also pass some parameters in here. So I'm going to pass SSL required uh, or require and a maximum of one connection because when we run our migration, I don't want to have like different channels open to my database. I just want one. By the way, this uh, script and the flow is heavily inspired by this article on Neon about using Drizzle and Neon. Uh, so kudos to this article. I just wanted to reference it in case uh, the creator comes across this. Now, we can finally uh, create a little main script. So what we want to do now is we want to try and call the migrate function using our database URL and using the migrations folders um, drizzle. So this is where we put our migrations file. Remember here was created. If you're using different folder names, make sure you're using those. And then I'm just gonna lock out um, migration successful or an error. Okay, we can close this and then we can call process.exit um, zero. And finally wrap this up and actually most important part call the main script. So here we go. This should now run in development or production mode, find our Drizzle migrations folder and run them on the database URL that we defined in the development uh, environment. Pretty cool. Let's see. So if we check out the Neon console, we should see that so far we have a schema, but there are zero tables. There's nothing in it. So let's change this. And we now want to run this and we can run just the migrate command. That's why I added this. So let's do npm run migrate and let's hope for the best. Running in development mode and successful. That sounds good. Let's check. I'm going to hit refresh here and yeah, we got the tables. Ah, nice. I love it. And of course, they have exactly the stuff that we wanted. So without writing your own SQL code, we have defined the tables here, the Postgres tables in Neon. This is great. This is great for everyone who especially uh, doesn't like to write any kind of SQL code. So um, this is my main branch. We're going to talk about branching uh, later as well. Uh, for now, we don't have to. We're going to come back to this later. Uh, as we also use the Neon uh, CLI. Maybe we can, uh, can we do this? Yeah, maybe we can. Like maybe we can actually do this uh, pretty soon. Let's first of all add a bit of data to this. Let's say this primary main branch is our production environment. And I want to import some data into this. So I'm going to go to the SQL editor and in here I'm going to paste this. So this is something I prepared based on uh, shop information from the, uh, what is the open uh, open shop? Just look for a shop API, dummy shop API, and you're gonna find this data. So uh, the fake store API, yeah, there we got it, fake store API. Because this also contains some images and uh, I, don't, I didn't wanna just hit the endpoint of the fake store API all the time. So I copied the JSON and prepared it into this insert statement for our table. So let's run this here and request completed successful and now we can go back to the tables and if we check out our products we should now see that we have a nice list of products now on top of that i would like to have a development branch so maybe we can do this right now with the um, neon uh, cli let's give this a try and close this i don't want to save this i don't want to save that um, let's do this okay so first of all, you have to install globally the Neon CTL. It's I think it's the Neon controller, most likely, right? Um, and then we can check this out. So this is pretty cool about Neon that you can easily create branches uh, based on your current data. 
uh, let's just give this a try. Neon create uh, controller branches. Uh, or we can do, first of all, neon controller branches. Let's see. Okay, this just shows everything. Let's do a list. Um, and then we see we got one branch. Okay, cool. Uh, let's do a second one. Let's create one. Let's create a branch. And here we go. Connection Yuri looks like this. I'm going to copy this over. Um, and I think actually this is my, I mean, this is now my production environment. It's kind of messed up. Um, let's just have a, let's, let's not make a big deal out of it. So we just want to see that we got two different environments. we got a development environment and we got a production environment. Um, so previously this looked like this and we can see that this is the one I added just right. Yeah, this is this one. Uh, this is our new branch. And I can once again now list this out and I should see both of them. So the one has the main name main, it's the primary, and the second one uh, should be in our database. Let's see this. Uh, so main branch, and we got another branch. And the great thing is everything is included here. <laughs> like. It's just a copy of our database and it takes about one second. So this is the thing that fascinated me about Neon in the first place when I checked them out. Um, like this instant branching of your data. So I'm gonna put a bit more data now into this. Um, so I'm on the branch right here. I'm gonna insert more data. So uh, you can find all of this, uh, these insert statements also on our uh, repository. And if I now go back to the tables, and check out the products once again. I think we should have about 20 products. Yeah, we have about 20 products in our Jolly Wildflower 35560. <laughs> we have about 10 products in the main primary branch. And depending on what I wanna do, I can now easily switch between the different environments and I can also do everything else with the CLI. So the CLI commands here, has commands for authentication. So you might actually have to run a uh, neon control auth before doing anything else, um, as this will show your project. Also, let's do this as well. This should um, list all my projects, right? There we go in my region as well. Also, I like really like the colors. Uh, are they providing this or is this my CLI? I don't know. But um, the thing is we can just easily switch between databases, projects and branches now with the CLI as well. So we have two data sets. We have two databases uh, which we've easily copied. Uh, we have created the cool drizzle migration script and now it's time to actually write our own um, code to connect uh, and offer a little API on top of the data. So let's start by adding an index TS in here. And I'm gonna do the same thing I had before, which is basically loading my .env file. If we're prod, we're using prod. If we're dev, we're using dev. Um, then I will create the actual app. So const app equals express. And once I got this, I will also tell this app, oops, sorry about that app.use. So I want to use JSON here to reply with the actual JSON data. And then finally, we're going to say app.listen uh, on my port. And then I'm going to lock out as always in every example that we're listening on this port. Cool. Um, I hope I hope I have the script. So let's check this out. I should be able to run npm run dev npm run dev. Uh, 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 listening on port 3k. That's great. Um, now we just need the actual API. So we're going to create a new file. I'm going to call this shop.ts and that file will contain all the information about the different routes in our application. So uh, we can already put this into our app here after we initialize the app. We can say uh, please import uh, shop router from shop. Okay, we probably need to uh, file what? Uh, it's not a module. Yeah, it will become a module pretty soon. I just want to put it in here so I don't forget about it and tell our app to please use the shop router. So we're going to define the different routes and endpoints in our shop router now. Uh, here we go. Here's the shop. 
Um, the first thing that we need to do is create a connection to our database. So let's do this by creating a new pool. Um, and the import comes now from PG. Um, the connection string is our database URL. Um, I can't remember exactly why I had to do it like this. I think it complains otherwise that it might not be set. And I wanna also, of course, use SSL. Then we also use our drizzle on top of that, uh, on the pool. But I think we wanna use drizzle from node Postgres now, exactly. And now I wanna define one little statement up front in case we, uh, we catch any specific error in our application. So uh, let's just put it up here. And of course, we're gonna use from express the request and response. And with that in place, let's write our first route. So we can just define on the router. Do we actually import the router? Oh, no, we haven't. Let's do this. Um, so this is our router in which we can define like get for product, orders, whatever you want. At this point, you should really have a nice, nice and clean setup for pretty much everything you want to do with your TypeScript um, Express backend. So this is the route I wanna set up first. Our app, of course, needs a list of products. Um, Copilot gives an idea what we wanna do, but I wanna do this by hand. Uh, maybe we can just say Copilot. Um, yeah, I wanna disable it globally for now. Uh, and I need the finally statement. Okay, this is going to be interesting. I think it's, it's been some time since I disabled Copilot, um, but I don't want to confuse us right now. So the cool thing, once again, about Drizzle is that we can now use it to query the data in a TypeScript-like way. So we can simply get all the rows by saying await database uh, dot select. Um, of course, we could have different commands in here and we wanna select from which table? Uh, the product table. So let's just import products from uh, our file here, products from db slash schema, what we defined up front. And that's it, that's really it. That's our select statement for the product table. And look at this, we can get all the types now because we're using TypeScript all along the stack. So that means I can work with the rows, uh, but in my case, I will just uh, return the JSON. So let's just, return the rows. If I catch an error, I'm gonna use my error function that we defined up front and I'm gonna hit save. So uh, finally, we should say export default router here. Then finally, our index file is happy as well. And we should have our first route. I haven't added any kind of live reload in here, bear with me. So just kill it and start it again. And now the final test. Are we able to use Postman to query the Neon database that we plugged into this uh, using our express route. This is really, this is where everything comes down that we've done so far in the first, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Um, I wanna zoom in for you, let's do this. Uh, can we do this? Yeah, of course, 150, that's not a lot. Uh, let's go to 200, ah, I don't know. Okay, localhost 3000 slash products, give it to me. And here is the data. Just saying that this is definitely not. So we are querying my data. Um, Shell Raven, Foldsec, number one, backpack. Uh, which API are we using? Uh, which Neon, we're currently on primary, right? We're on primary, yeah. We're on primary here. So this is the data we're currently getting back. Should be 10 results up until ID 10, exactly. Um, love it. It just works, <laughs> it just works. Um, so we've really come a long way at this point uh, on our full stack journey of implementing uh, the migrations file of creating the database and now querying the database from here. And at this point, basically the sky's the limit. You can just do everything you want um, with all the different pieces that we have combined so far. So let's pick up the pace and finish this router uh, a bit faster. The second endpoint that I would like to add is, of course, one to probably get one product by its ID. And again, this would be really, really easy uh, as we can use Drizzle. No, I don't wanna use Copilot to fix this. I'm able to fix this myself. I'm gonna use equal from Drizzle ORM. And again, just see, we're extracting the ID as always. 
and then we're calling database select from which table and all the time using uh, our cool definitions uh, where equals product ID equals the ID that we pass to this. So really here as well, it's cool that we don't have to say like equals ID equals something. No, we can be sure about the field name. Could be anything else, but because of this connection, everything is safe. Again, let's kill this. Let's do this again. Let's try to get a product by ID. So ID two or three or 11, which doesn't exist, but 10 should exist. So we're able to get all this by ID. So we could of course change this and not include all the information here, uh, but that's totally up to you. Now, the final route to create a product, uh, to create an order is somewhat more complicated. So I'm gonna bring this in and talk you um, through this function as it was really somewhat challenging to set it up. So um, this is a bit bigger. I uh, can find fight name orders. Yes, this comes also from our DB and this as well. Just want to fix the red uh, stuff before I tell you what's going on. So if we want to create an order, um, I want to have a body which consists of an email and the products. Um, the products are the order body. Uh, what, did I, what did I just define here? Products of the type order body. Uh, did I have any typings in here? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. I had to use a different name for this. Uh, so they're available as order body uh, because a product is our table and has led to some confusion with Drizzle and that didn't work out very well for me. Um, so again, the body of our um, call would look like this. So this is what we need to do from React Native. We're gonna have to send our email and we're gonna have to send uh, products and that's going to be an array. And then we have like one product, we're gonna have the ID of the product and probably something like the quant quantity uh, of the product, okay? And then we might have more products. So this is the ID here. Um, okay, with that in place, we need to create our order items and the final order. So we begin a new transaction as we need to do different things and we wanna do them all at once and run that on the database. So the first thing is we create a new order. Uh, we run this on the transaction, we insert into the orders database, a new order with customer email and return that new order. We just created it so that we can use the ID of that new order for all the order items that we want to create. So remember the reference we made with the foreign keys. Then I also want to make sure that I'm using the up-to-date prices. So I will grab um, for all the items in the order body, the price by selecting the product and then returning that price. So we're gonna have these product prices uh, available. Now I can go through all the products that we have and I can calculate it by using the price and the actual quantity that this order item has. And finally, this results in a new insert into our order items. We can now reuse the order ID that we just created uh, up here, so nice connection here, new order, and here's the new order ID. Then we also have the product ID, uh, which is the order item product ID, so the order item here, uh, just using some visual today, I installed this yesterday, so I'm going fancy. <laughs> and then uh, we of course have the quantity and the total and want that returned. So this creates a bunch of order items. At this point, we have all the order items, or call this order products, and then I wanna just calculate the total so I can finally update the initial order that I started. The initial order, if we check out our Drizzle file again, uh, the, the schema, the order by default has a total of zero. So when we initialize it, uh, we don't have to send that, and now is the place where we update the total of that order. Um, and finally, we return all that information and then send out the new order back to the client. Okay, this was a quite heavy function. Um, I hope I explained all the different parts as good as possible. Let's see if we can make this work with um, our database. So uh, I already prepared something before. Can we make this a bit smaller? Yeah. So email test at galaxies and here are my products, product ID, let's say product nine. I got two of them and product three, I got one of them. Let's hit send. 
And cannot, yeah, I should restart. <laughs> I'm really used to live reload. Okay, let's try again. And there we go. This is the order that was created. Order ID, customer email. The total was calculated for us. Very nice. In the different products, ID one, order ID, product ID, quantity, uh, total. Now, uh, we could also write a function to actually resolve the information in here with order ID and product ID and combine this. I had this in a different branch of the repository when I uh, initially, or in a different commit, you might want to check out the different commits in here. Um, in like in the first one or somewhere here. Uh, come on, here we go. Uh, there I had functionality two connect and uh, get the order. So in that case, I still used raw SQL statements. That would be different now, but you see that contains some inner joins and some aggregation, or if you wanna get one specific order, it's pretty much same story. Uh, and I didn't wanna confuse this anymore as we won't really use those endpoints in the React Native application anyway. So let's finally check if we can see this. Uh, yep, here we go. This is my order and the different order items which are connected to that order are in the order items table. And again, I could now easily branch this. If I would create another branch, I would have exactly that information in the new branch of that application. All right, we've come a long way. Um, you have the API hopefully up and running now at port 3K. Um, you got everything that you need set up with the different environments. You got the scripts. So I think at this point we can leave the backend area and jump into the front end. All right, so let's move on with the Expo React Native application. I already started a new one using Create Expo App Latest. I called this my shop and I used the blank template using Expo SDK 49 in this case. Uh, oh no, I don't wanna run this again. <laughs> um, so I now have my shop and server in the same folder. Uh, we're gonna use React Navigation this time. So we're gonna have to add a few commands or a few installations. Uh, let's do this right in the beginning. I also want to use TypeScript, so touch tsconfig.json. And usually Expo will figure out the rest for us once we run the first command. Then we're gonna install React Navigation Native and the native stack. And additionally to this, we also need to run one additional command for the React Native uh, screens and React Native safe area context. And with all of that in place, we can just hit npx expo, uh, which should bring it up. Yes, I wanna use TypeScript, so that's what I mentioned before. Expo usually figures this out if you have it. And I'm going with i for the iOS simulator. And hopefully we should now see my application come up here. Yes, there we go, open up app.js. That's what we're gonna do pretty soon, my friend. So here we go. I'm going to rename this actually to app.ts because we're using TypeScript in our application and we're going to replace everything in here. Uh, actually, we can keep a bit. Uh, let's export default function app and we're going to return the navigation container, which has to wrap our application. I just want to use navigation container. Oh, uh oh, 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 I fear something. I fear something. Uh, let's confirm this React. Yeah, we're on React Navigation 6. Always great that it happens right before I start a new video. I love it. Okay, Simon just started this on the wrong foot. It is of course app.tsx, not just app.ts. So once we got this, it will just complain that we don't have any children, but we're gonna wrap our navigation now in the navigation container. Now we're on the right path to do everything. Let's create a new folder app and within I'm gonna create a folder navigation, navigation and I'm gonna hit the products stack.tsx. So this will be our navigation for the app and as I said, we're using TypeScript so we're gonna have to do a few things uh, to make all of that work correctly. Let's start be by, <laughs> be by defining our uh, products stack param list. And once we got the param list, we can then also um, implement the actual const products 
uh, stack nav. So in case you might want to have a tab bar or something, then it becomes a lot easier if you just structure it this way. Uh, this would now return something uh, with the product stack navigator, which we still need to define. Uh, so the product stack would look like this. Native stack screen uh, screen props using our type. I will just put in any for a second uh, and create this. And of course, now we need all the different imports from our React navigation. So let's put this up here. Uh, native stack screen props. Um, native stack screen. Oh yeah, now props uh, navigator first of all. Native stack screen. <laughs> it's hard to. Pro <laughs> uh, it's hard to have everything correct. Native. Jesus, um, I was on the wrong line of my script. Um, the first thing we of course want to do is create the native stack navigator using our type from up here. So now we're back on track. I feel like the backend was easier to implement than all the types here in our front end. Well, anyway, um, we're gonna have two, well, kind of two and a half routes. Uh, first of all, we're gonna have a screen to display the product. Uh, this screen doesn't need any other information, but then we're gonna also have the product detail screen. And usually if you open a product detail screen, you would pass some kind of number to that screen. Later on, we're gonna also have a card modal. Uh, card modal, I'm gonna just hit to do in here. So that's what we're gonna do later. Okay, we got the product stack and the product stack can be used now to define the different screens in our application. In fact, um, this is already most of the stuff that we need. Um, so let's make sure that we also export default product stack navigation and then our page looks pretty good already so uh let's probably add our first screen i'm gonna add a new file under screens slash um let's call this one products.tsx i'm gonna do a little script for react native functional export which gives us the products here and then we can use this as the first screen of our application. So the products stack dot screen uh, name for this one will be uh, products. We get this because we have defined the type up here. That is pretty nice. The component is the products that we just added. Um, and I will also add a little header title so we can do this under options. Uh, something like header title. Let's call this one neon shop. Okay, great. Uh, the options is closed. We can also do this in one line. And this is our first view. Now we should be able to render this by going back to our app TSX and including our stack. So this is the product stack navigation that we want to use. Hit save. And our application should, after reload, yeah, we should. Oh, that's a, oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> Let's probably uh, do this just again uh, and open up iOS. Uh, usually this gives me some trouble in the reloading, but let's hope it works. Yes, here we go. Our shop with the first page is on screen and no problem with React Navigation version six, all good. Okay. Um, we got the first screen. Uh, we can render this. Let's make this also look a bit nicer. Um, so we can change the overall options here. So globally, I want to set some screen options and I will use a header style in here and a background color using uh, a cool neon color. So I'm going to use this one. Ooh, that looks fancy, huh? Doesn't it? Uh, I will also use the header tint color and set the header tint color to 141414. Uh, just a slight change here in the color. And later we can also add a button for our card up here. And we can also define the different screens in our application here later. Okay, um, I would say we now need to implement the product screen and display the products from our API. 
as we don't really have a lot of complex state regarding the server in this application, I'm not using 10 state query and we're just going to do fetch request. However, if your application has a lot of server state involved and different uh, screens and you might want to add some caching, check out my other live stream where I talked about how we can use 10 state query to make this even better. But in our case, I will just create a new file under API. I'm going to call this API.ts. I'm really not creative with that one. And within this file, uh, I want to make my HTTP calls to my backend. To do this, I will also add a new env file. Uh, thanks, it always works on the second try. And in that env file, I'm going to add expo public API URL. And we can do either your local IP or just use local host. So I will just use local host. Um, localhost usually won't work if you try your app on a device. In that case, you might need your local IP. Now, in my API file, I can now grab my API URL. Uh, you shouldn't have any secret information in the env file of your expo application. Just want to make that sure. Um, this is not the same like the env file we had in our server. That won't won't be available to anyone. However, uh, so the full stack the um, the env file in the server part in the express server is not accessible to anyone the env part here Will be at some point bundled in your code like we do this here So this will up in your bundle and people will find this so don't put any secret information in here um, Now let's add a few interfaces as well I just made them up up front So this is just resembles the products table or the product in our product table then this is how an order should look like. Uh, it would have an email and an array of products with a product ID and a quantity. And finally, we might have an order that looks just like this. Okay, first function that we need, export async function uh, fetch products. Uh, let's just do this like this. Um, should be a promise. Uh, that should return a list of products. Okay. Okay. Uh, looks good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Looks good. Looks good. Okay. In here, we're going to try and make our call. So cons response equals await fetch. We don't really need to use Axios or anything else. Just use your API URL and then slash products. That should give us a list of the products from the back end. And if the response is not okay, uh, in that case, we might want to throw a little error. So let's just uh, throw this fail to fetch products. And otherwise we can return await uh, response to JSON. So we still need to convert this. Uh, in the catch case, uh, catch error, uh, we will also just return an empty product array. So no great error handling today, but that should be fine. Okay, back to other products. Um, on the product screen, we of course need to load that data. So let's use and use effect. And I just have to tell you one thing. In all the other tutorials before, I usually used Copilot and I just disabled it like the first time for this after a recommendation from Colby Fayok. Uh, you should check out his channel as well. Thanks, Colby. Um, it just feels so much better to record this video without Copilot <laughs> because it's usually in my videos throwing in these recommendations that I actually don't need and it's confusing you as well. And I just feel so liberated. I just had to tell you this because I had this internal feeling of, wow, this feels right now really good without the Copilot stuff. So maybe from time to time, just disable Copilot. Okay. Enough of the rent, Copilot is great usually. <laughs> uh, let's set up our state with products and set products. And once we got that, uh, we're gonna initialize this with an empty state. Okay. And now after running the load, uh, we can grab the data here from our fetch products, which we can import, nothing we need to pass to it, and set products with the new data. Okay, um, maybe we're gonna lock this out and I will also call the load function here because we have an empty dependency array. This function should run once in the beginning. Let's hit save and see. And I get back no data. Okay, that was an easy fix. Just make sure that you reload your uh, expo command once you add the env file because otherwise it's not picking up the environment and we can't connect to the server. So 
now I get back all the products. Let's get back to the product screen. That was where we left off and implement a little list to see all the products. So I'm gonna just use um, a flat list, flat list component. You could also of course use a flash list, but I didn't wanna do it this time since I then have to run the expo dev client and uh, I just didn't wanna do it. So uh, let's create some styles. We will use a simple style sheet from React Native, no fancy library this time. And I'm gonna start for the container. I usually start with flex one and I will also give this a little a nice background color, F2, 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 uh, wrap this in a string and assign this as the styles.container. Cool. Um, now we need to render the flat list. And for the flat list, we need to render the different items. Um, we can for now use a render item function in here, uh, but we will quickly create our own function. Let, let's just do this. It's just better to write your own function. So I'm gonna call this render product product item. This one will extract the item. And then let's just, uh, actually we don't need any logic in here. So we can just make this uh, return, let's say just a view and then a text. Can we just import text from React Native? Uh, or do I show, or a, oh, I got this one. Uh, and then let's use item.name or title, something uh, should be like product product underscore name or something like that. <laughs> I don't know, we're gonna see. Uh, and we're gonna pass this in here to render the items. And the actual items is of course our products. Did I say products? Yes, I say products. Okay, let's see. Yes, this is a whole list of items. Doesn't it look beautiful? Uh, this is how you create an epic list. <laughs> uh, okay, um, on top of that, you might wanna add a key extractor to correctly get the item keys. Uh, so let's set this to item.id. I kinda would like to have um, the right typings. Let's say this is going to be um, product array. And then we might get a bit of problems here and there. No, that's fine. And then I think we're gonna have an easier time if we use something like this. Um, doesn't this should be products is products and the item. Um, the flat list should know that this is now an array of products. But anyway, um, not a big deal. I'm gonna keep it like it is. Uh, okay. So here we go, we have the products, we have the key extractor. Uh, we will actually set the number of columns because I want to display um, two next to each other. Changing now on the fly is not supported. Change the key, yeah, then just reload it. Just reload it if you have a problem with that. Okay, you can't see it right now, but now we have the different product items. And we of course also need some styling for them. So let's now get into the styling for the product items. Um, this one, the render product item should now also change because I want to click on the product. So instead of using just a view, we're going to make this a touchable opacity uh, from React Native and passing in the style that we just created the product item. Uh, on press, we will have to do some kind of navigation. Um, and therefore we need to access the navigation. Uh, we haven't done this by now. So the problem is with TypeScript, usually in your screens, you can access the navigation here. Um, but once you're gonna use this, it will complain because you don't really have any types here. So what we're gonna add is we're gonna say that this is using uh, the products page props. And we should define this here. We haven't done this so far. Uh, so let's get back to our routing for a second and define two things in here. So we need the props for the products page. Uh, export type products props. Uh, it's just a cleaner way. I mean, you can use uh, you can use any if you want to, but uh, you really shouldn't do this. So native stack screen props, um, passing in the products stack param list and then the name of the screen which in this case is products okay close this and this is our first type second type will be pretty similar let's just set this up 
um, product details page props. So this is also a nice lesson on um, using product details on using uh, TypeScript and React Navigation. So now with those types in place, we can go back here and on that page say, okay, this is actually products page. Oh, this should be page. I just want a products page props. I think that sounds better. Products page props. And it's pretty clear. And now we can get that navigation and we can correctly use it with TypeScript. So if we say this, we got all the things go back, uh, navigate. And that's of course what we want to do. We're going to navigate to eventually the product details page and uh, a lot of red in here. Cannot find name touchable opacity. Okay. Yeah, we can fix that one. Um, on press, we're going to navigate to the product details page. So this is still in here. And as an object, we pass the ID to that page, uh, which should usually be item.id. Um, I kind of want to get the right typings in here as well. So I think this is like list render item uh, and then it would get a product. I think it looks like this. If you do it like this, yeah, then you also get uh, the right typings in here. Uh, and you're mad about what? Uh, because the ID is not a string, huh? Yeah. Yeah, now you're happy. Okay, cool. So we got our product items. Uh, we still got the text in here, which is the product name. In fact, I want to use an image as well. So of course we use different style sheets. So let's call this one uh, product image. And then we would have product name and probably also something like product price. And we can set them up in a second. Let's just put them in here. So I'm also going to use an image from React Native. Oh, I think I messed up the import. Uh, image, 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 image. Nope. Image uh, from React Native. Um, let's close this already. So the image needs a URI, and that URI should point to our. Uh, product. No, it's the item dot. Oh, come on. Give me the code completion. Uh, why not? What's your problem? Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, because we say Yuri and then item dot product image. Let's see if this changes anything. Uh, probably do I once again have to, oh yeah, if we don't give any size to the image, it won't work. So let's set the style for the image as well to styles dot product image. And the product image should just use like, let's just use the whole width. Um, no, let's just use, let's, let's do them 100, 100. So that should look good. Yes. Okay. Not too bad. <laughs> it's a good start. Um, now to the general product item container, we have those two items per row uh, and everything should use its full space. So I'm going to set this to flex one. Uh, we're going to give all of this a bit of margin. Uh, let's just do five margin and probably uh, padding of 10. That looks a bit better. I also would like to align the items in the center. So it looks like this better. And then I also need a background color in here. Uh, we're going to give them a white background because we have a slightly gray background. So now we have these nice blocks in here. I think that looks good. Uh, additionally, we could give this a border radius as well. So let's use a border radius of eight. Then we have nice rounded borders around these items. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, for the product image, we can also set the resize mode if we want to. So I would like to see the whole picture. So I'm going to say contain. And then it looks like this. This is already a nice start. Um, we do have the product name and we want to display the text, uh, the, the price as well. So we had for the styling, the product name and the product price. Uh, so we can use all of this in here. Now let's see how we can align this. Uh, so for the product name, we're going to use margin top to give this a bit separation between the image, uh, font size of 14 to make this 
somewhat bigger. I think 14 is actually default, but uh, we're gonna also use font weight uh, bold. So a bit bigger text. I think that should look good. And finally, the price uh, should also have margin top just four for a bit of separation. Uh, same font size, but it should get a different uh, color. So I'm going to use uh, 666. And then we have like a gray color here. Uh, I'm going to just put today a dollar sign in front of this. So let's just assume that our price is our all and all. Of course, you could have like a function to check that. That should be fine as well. If you don't like it, the bottom part, you could also, of course, use a safe area view in here. Um, oh, just update the import and then we would have to uh, update this. But no, I think this looks good. Yeah, let's use the safe area view. That looks actually better. Cool. Um, we should be able to the action navigate with payload was not handled by any navigator. Okay, yeah, that's not a big problem. Uh, let's get back into this. So this is screen is basically finished. I think it's not even, it's not basically finished. It is actually finished. <laughs> we can uh, go to the next one, which is the product details screen. So product details.tsx, React Native Functional Export. And let's first include this in our stack. So we have the first screen. Uh, now we're going to add the second screen, which has the name product uh, details. So this should be our second one. It should get the product details component that we just added. And for the header title, we will set this to an empty string. And voila, because we've set all of this up before, we are already able to get that nice navigation. Now, what we need to do is of course on that screen to extract the information by the ID that we pass to that screen. That means we, of course, need one additional API function. So let's add this quickly. This follows the same scheme like we had before. This time we will use a product ID and then call our API slash product slash product ID and get back that one item. I mean, we could also have passed the whole object to the next page, um, but I kind of like the setup, especially if you later speak about uh, universal links, if we would use the expo router or host this on the web, um, then it makes sense if you have a different uh, specific product details page that it just loads the information from your API. Cool. Um, with that in place, we can move on to the product details screen. So on that screen, I want to extract first of all the ID. Uh, and I can get the ID through the parameters through the route of that page. And so now our typings come in handy again. So these are the product details page props. And if we add that, we can simply say route.params and TypeScript is happy about what we are doing. Um, on top of that, I wanna use effect. So use effect and this one doesn't need any dependencies. And what I want to do is I want to fetch the product in there. So I'm going to write, um, actually, um, I think I don't really need to do it. Let's just do it in here. Const fetch product equals async function and make sure to call that. And what we're going to do in here is the same thing like we did on our other page. So now we're trying to load the product data from the API using fetch product details and we pass in the ID. Um, and once we got the data, we will set this to our state. So let's add a product and set product. Use state uh, should be a product or could actually be null as well. Um, could now could be null as well. So let's do it like this makes more sense. Okay. And now we can call set product with the product data that we got from the API, which can also be null. Um, as we see products, but that should be fine now. And finally a little catch block. So if there are any errors, I wish you all the best of luck. Uh, let's just put an error on the console uh, error and then handle this accordingly in your application, please. 
Okay, but what I want to see is if uh, we are able to actually see this. So let's go here. And yes, we are able to fetch the information. If I go to a product page, we already get the information once again from our API. Um, and now we just need to create the view for that page and then we can move into the final pieces of this tutorial um, using some kind of state management. So uh, let's create our styles for this page. Again, I won't change my approach. I will still use style sheet on here uh, dot create. And for the container, as always, I'm going to use flex one flex one and probably a bit of padding to give all of this. We might use the safe area view in here as well. Uh, and style. Oh, come on, just add the import. It's not that hard. Style equals styles dot container. Okay, so I'm on that page. Um, I should be on that page. I don't really see that this is adding padding to my page. Uh, maybe I should reload that page. Uh, well, we're gonna get to the padding in a second. Okay, uh, let's put in the image first. So just like before, we can use pretty much the same approach. So source is our actual image, product dot product dot image. You love it really when we use TypeScript uh, in all the places, it just works so good. Close this. And we need some styling for the image. So for the product image this time, uh, we're gonna probably use a bit different styling since we wanna make this bigger on the screen. Let's give the styles first in here. And then let's say for the product image, we're gonna use a height of 300. So it renders nicely in here. We're gonna set the resize mode this time to contain again. Now, okay, shows the full picture. And what do we need as well? I don't think we actually need some kind of width, right? Um, but this looks actually pretty cool. I really like it. Um, so I wanna make sure that the product is always set. So I will have wrapped this in a little check. So product and end, and then we follow up with the actual stuff in here. And I'm gonna wrap this in an empty fragment that makes sure that the product is all because we're fetching the product it's an async operation and it's not going to be there immediately here we go um also let's probably give this a little bit of border radius just for good old times uh, i like i like rounded borders you too i don't know um we i will just copy now over the product what we had before so we also had product name and product price I'm gonna put this in here. That will definitely come in handy. So after the image, let's use a text um, style, styles.product name. And guess what we put in? <laughs> product.product .product name. Okay, shows up here. Um, not the best place. We probably wanna uh, also have a bit more margin here, uh, like this. Why is the stuff in here not centered? Um, should we center everything or would it work like this? Um, let's let's look at how I did this initially. Uh, so initially, no, we actually had it like this. I think it's cool. We're gonna do it just like that. Um, so the only thing that we should probably change for the product name is that we need a different font size um, to actually make this a bit bigger. And I feel like my padding here on the container is not working. Uh, can I set this to margin? Yeah, that makes it work better. Cool. Uh, we have the name text. Um, let's just add a bit more. So I'm going to add the category, description, and price down here. And the product category and price, uh, not super special stuff. So product price and product category could look like this. Um, product price. Maybe a bit different. Let's do it like this. Okay, looks good, I think. Um, let's. Do we want to change this? My head is. Uh, I, let's hope my head is not covering this yet. Um, and product description. Yeah, for product description as well, some styling. So here we go. A nice little details page so far. 
And now the interesting part begins. We are able to render everything, work greatly with the API and everything is cool. But now we need real user interaction and we need to add stuff to our cart. And now things get really interesting because yes, we could handle this internally, but I think we can do better. And for that, we're gonna add another library called Zustand. Uh, I guess that's how you would pronounce it if you're an English speaking country. I from Germany would say Zustand because this actually means state in German. This is a German word. Uh, I think the same is true for what's the other library, Yotai. I think this is Japanese for a state. And we're gonna install Zustand. Um, now I'm gonna say Zustand. I'm sorry. Uh, for all English speaking folks, try to pronounce it correctly. It's Zustand. <laughs> You're gonna have trouble with that, right? Uh, okay, so with Zustand, oh, it's, it's hard for me to switch between English and German <laughs> now. Uh, we can create a store in which we manage our, not our birth, but we're gonna manage our card in that store. So let's get into this. Um, I'm actually gonna copy this over and I'm gonna create a new file under state slash card store dot ts. So this is how I would kind of like to start it. Um, I would also like to create an interface for my card uh, state. So that already defines what we're gonna do um, with that state or what's gonna be available on this state. So first of all, we will of course um, have all the products a user added to the card. That's going to be an array and there will be a product, but there will also be a quantity. And to fix that, I will just add um, quantity, quantity, which is going to be a number. So this is the products array in uh, our card state. Then we're gonna of course have some um, functionality in here. We're gonna have something that will add a product. Um, this will receive a product. And then we have void because this is not really doing anything besides changing our state. Just like that, we will also have something to, let's call this one, reduce a product or remove. Now it's not remove, I will just remove remove it if it's going to zero, but overall it's more like a reduce, so add one or minus one. Um, then I might at some point also wanna clear the card and that's like a uh, instruction, if we finish our order, I wanna clear this. And I will also have the total uh, which is the total amount of, uh, or the total price for the current order. So this is our interface. And now we're gonna create our Zustand store based on this interface. So let's call this one use card store instead. And we're gonna create this and use our card state. So then we're gonna have really nice stuff in here. First of all, this begins with an empty array of products and also the total value should be zero. Then we would have more uh, functions in here. So uh, you can check out the whole documentation if you want to, but basically uh, we can now define different uh, functions in here or the different actions that will update our state. So just like this, just like fetch, uh, we would then update our store and this is everything that you really need to understand about uh, Zustand. So that makes it a really easy library to use. So we had add product, which would do something with a product. Um, and that would call the set function. So we wanna set our state to something new. State goes here. Uh, this one's a bit more complex. I would like to get rid of the red lines. So let's see if I can uh, figure this one out up front. Uh, we are closing the state. It's not a sign. Can I just return like null or something? Uh, <laughs> add product. Uh, are we in which color we are here? I wanna just add like reduce product as well. Uh, let's see, reduce prior. I would like to really have this somehow implemented in clear card. Um, that one's actually pretty easy, clear card. Maybe we should do clear card first. Uh, okay, yeah. 
Am I still in the right way here, set? Yeah, I think so. I think we should be fine. I think we, yeah, that's better. Okay, now we just need to get to the right lines. Okay, and clear card uh, is the easiest one, as I said, as this will just set our state back to the initial state that we had, um, so with no items in the card. So here we go. Uh, in our clear card, we would set state dot total back to zero. And we would also return new state with products uh, being an empty array again. Cool. Okay, this is our used card store. Uh, I'm glad we finally got rid of the red lines. And we can also hit export default used card store so we can later use it. Now we need the two functions to add something to the card and to remove it from the card. So to add something to our card, what we want to do is first of all check if we actually have the product in the card. And for that we can access our state and check if we have that product. What we can do as well is we can update the total of our state uh, to plus equals the product dot uh, product underscore price. This will already update our total. Now, if we have the product, we also need to increase the quantity of that product. Otherwise, we would add it and that would actually be a bit easier. So, in the else case, what we want to do is we want to return the new products as uh, all the items that we previously had in the products plus the new product that we have and all the information from that new product and the quantity one. So this is like initially adding it the first time to the product state, okay? So this one is an empty array. We say, hey, please add this cool gem to my card. And then we'd say, okay, let's use all the products I already had. Okay, that's nothing. And the new one. But if I now go it for the second or third time, this would be like all the previous items and then the new item. Okay, but in the case that we already have it in our state, we actually need to find it and just update the quantity, which is a bit more complicated. So in this case, the products that we need to return is an array of state.products map as we need to go through all the items and we need to find the one that we need to update. So if the product.id is equal to the product. So once again, this is now this product, product, product. Make sure uh, you get the reference right. Uh, if the IDs are equal, then we need to update it. And otherwise, we will just return the product as it currently is. So in this case, we would return everything, the information from the product plus an updated quantity using the current quantity plus one. Okay, I think I lost about 95% of you still watching this video. Um, but if you stop it and look at this, this totally makes sense. So we're just iterating all the items in our card, finding the item that we want to add, which is the new product, and then just updating the quantity. Um, we have the else block. So now the only thing missing is our reduce product. Uh, so let's implement that as well. Set, we have the state and the function to update our state. So we're gonna start this one by updating the total value here. And this time we of course need to remove this. So uh, state.total minus equal uh, product dot product price. And now, <laughs> we need to return our products again. So uh, the object with products. And this time we want to filter out all the products if it's now at zero. So we have this card, we have like three items, they have different quantities. And if we change the quantity to zero, we of course want to reduce this, uh, remove this. So state.products uh, map, we're going to go through every product once again. And let's see if the product ID ID is equal to product that we're trying to update. In that case, we will 
uh, update it. Otherwise, we're going to re just return this. Um, we're going to return all the information from the product and change the quantity to p.quantity minus one. Okay, that was kind of hard. And we add now one more thing. This is just the opposite of what we did up here. So this was adding it, this was uh, removing it. We also don't need to check if it's not in there because otherwise we couldn't uh, remove it. But what we also want to do is we want to call filter finally and we're going to filter for every product we're going to check is the product quantity greater than zero otherwise we would filter it out which means if we reduce the quantity of an item to zero it would be removed from our card as well and with that you have the perfect zustand store for a card now we can easily add this use this across all the pages in our application and it's going to be so much easier to manage our state. We can just easily go everywhere, add a product, remove a product and always check out our cart. And that's what we're going to implement now. Implementing the cart is now somewhat easy and somewhat still of a little challenge as we need to use our Zustand store correctly on the product details page and uh, the other pages of the application. So let's begin on the product details page where we first of all need to add our store or to actually use the store. Um, in order to use the store, uh, we go ahead with const and everything that we want. So we want the products that are currently in the card. Uh, we want the add product and we want the reduce product. I don't know if reduce product was a good or bad name. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think I should have called that. So we get it at the use card store. And now we need to listen to the different changes of our state and um, use them or we just need to define the object here. Uh, so this looks a bit strange. Uh, so we're simply using the different values. That means we could use different names as well, but I will just stick to the names we have and provide products, add product and reduce product to our page using the according functions or values from the state of Zustand. Um, additionally, we don't really have something to give us the current uh, quantity of one item. Uh, we could extract that from the state and but there's just the array of products. So we are going with a tiny different approach. Um, I'm going with count and set count and use state uh, zero in the beginning. Um, and what we're gonna do is we will add a use effect block. And this time we will not use an empty dependencies array. But we're gonna wait or check for changes to the products array. And when the products array changes, we wanna call a function, uh, let's call this one const update product quantity, in which we update our product quantity. So I'm gonna add a little lock in here, not lockbox. <laughs> That's not what I wanted. Uh, I wanted to lock to the console updated products. And that means in our update product quantity, I just need to find the uh, our current selected object from the product array and then update our count based on that. But let's do that in a second. Let's begin with a new um, view. So for that, we will need a bit new styling. Um, let's go ahead and let's add three. We're gonna have a buttons container, which we render below our price. So maybe it's time to shift this to the side as that makes more sense. And you don't really need to see my face uh, covering our precious application. So here we go. Here's the app now. And below the product price, we're gonna add a new view style styles.buttons container. And within, we're going to add the buttons to add or remove a button from our card. Uh, so we are using the touchable opacity once again in here. And now it becomes really, really easy what we want to do. So let's first of all set the style. Uh, style is, of course, styles.button. Uh, and this one will also get an Ionicon. 
Um, can we just add the import from export vector icons? Okay. Uh, Ionicons, let's use name remove. So this is for like the minus button. Um, I'm gonna set the size to 24. And I'm gonna set the color. So I haven't defined my like constants. So I'm gonna use the primary color from before. And that should give us a little button that looks like this. So it takes up the whole space of the buttons container, which is using the flex direction row. Um, but we're gonna just have three buttons and they will share the space equally in that row. So I can copy this one and have this one to be like the add button. So we're gonna have two now. And in the center, I will just put a little text element. And this text element will get the styles.quantity and we display our current count. That is the idea. So that gives us a view that looks like this. Nothing happens right now, no big deal. Uh, we're gonna figure that out in a second. So as we extracted all the functionality from our Zustand store, we can just use add product and reduce product and don't have to care about anything else that goes on in the background. So for our first button, uh, which is the remove button, we can just set on press and on press will simply use reduce product with our current product. And now we copy this and put it to the second button. And instead of reduce product, we use add product. And now let's see, nothing happens because we haven't implemented the functionality to actually update our product count quantity. Um, so this is our count value right here. As I said, we don't, or we're not easily able to get like the Fjellraven Foldsack number one from the product array, um, or at least not in a cool way that looks good. So instead, our update product quantity would be called. Uh, so we see, uh, whenever I do something, uh, update product quantity should be called, I assume at least. <laughs> okay. Um, did I, am I, oh, I'm listening to the, oh yeah, that's a good catch. Oh, a good one. So we definitely want products in here. So we're listening for changes or watching for changes of products. Now it works. So now it's triggered all the time. And now whenever the function is called, we will simply um, use a little filter. So let's say uh, products. So these are all the products that are currently in the card. And we're gonna filter them. And for every product, we're gonna check if the product.id is equal to um, the ID that we used. We can actually reuse that, right? The ID we used for the routing. So that's the ID of the current product. That means we get back one item, hopefully. So if result.length uh, is greater than zero or actually does exist, we're gonna update our count and set the count to result at the index zero, so we have to use index zero because our filter always returns an array with the items. Uh, and in the else case, we're gonna set my count back to zero. And in a perfect world, yes, it works. And the cool thing is I can now navigate around. Uh, cannot read property ID of null. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me, let me, let's do a reload. Let's do a reload, I think maybe or I hope at least that the state had a problem. So gonna add two jackets. Oh, we do have a problem. Um, so if result cannot read property ID of null. Well, that is certainly not the place where you have to check for the ID, my friend. Um, product, oh yeah, I have to use p.id. That was my bet. Okay, three of them, two of them. And the jacket still had two in the store. So you now see that we have a fully working card in the background using Zustand. And that's the cool thing uh, and why I wanted to use this kind of store because the implementation is quite easy and we can easily add this to our page without wrapping our whole app in context or doing some fancy stuff. No, we can just insert the use card store wherever we want and we're able to extract the information. I will show you why this is so cool with another example now. And that is if we navigate back to the product stack. Let's say we now wanna have um, a modal. Actually, let's add that page for now. So to screens, I wanna add a card 
modal.tsx. So that's what we're going to implement now as the last part here. Uh, and I will put this in here. So there's the card modal. We don't have to pass any information to that screen. So I'll say undefined. And we include this as another screen in our application. So this one will be the card modal. It's using the card modal page. Uh, options, I want to say header shown false because on the modal I don't want to show the header and I will set the presentation to modal. So that will actually open this as a nice little card modal on our page. And now I want to render an additional card button up here that shows the count of our um, current card. So let's add a card button component in here. We can also do this in a new file, but uh, I will just do it in here for now. Um, we of course need the navigation since we won't or we will be able um, to open our card modal from here. And we will now use the same setup like we had on our product details page from Zustand. So we are extracting products using the use card store. And again, we have to say or specify what exactly we are extracting here. And I think I had, oh yes, that works better. So products will be state.products. Uh, we could also have total, but I don't really need total, I think. Um, product is the product does ex not exist on T type void. Uh, where did I go wrong? Do we have the use card store? We have it up there. I think there needs to be another bracket around this. Uh, yes, that's better. That's better. So now we got the product. Uh, and we're going to add the same logic like we had in our other page. Uh, with the use effect to update that, but that's maybe going to do this in a second. For now, let's implement the view. So the view will be a touchable opacity since we want to navigate on press to the details page, uh, not to the modal page, of course. And we can use navigation.navigate to card modal. And this will complain because of TypeScript. Uh, I will show you how we can fix that in a second. For now, let's use it like it is. And let's put in a little view and then a text which has the actual count. Um, do we have the count? No, we don't have the count yet. So let's use our state like before on this component. Um, return, are you, what are you mad about? Uh, that I should wrap this or that we don't have the import yet. Yeah, most likely this one. And also the text. Come on, just add text from <laughs> React Native. It's not that hard. Okay, so up here we have a button. Um, oh no, we are not using it yet. Yeah, good catch, good catch. Uh, we are able to change our general screen options here. Um, or we do it, yeah, let's do it here. Uh, let's just set header right to a new component and that will be the card button. So now it should render up here, exactly. And if I have something in my store, it's not showing up there yet because we're actually not making any real use of count and the products. So as I said, we're using a new use effect. We once again will react to all changes regarding the products array. So this comes here. And then we can get the new count by saying what we already had on the product details page. So I'm lazy now and copying this over. Uh, const count equals, um, oh, actually this is something else. Yeah, this is not the count for one item. This is the full count. Um, so that means uh, we need products. Okay, think with me, we need for all the products in the card we need to add that quantity and get one final value. Maybe stop the video and give it a try yourself. Dim, 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 dim. Okay, you can do this if you want to with products.reduce. Uh, that would be an interesting case. So we had the previous value and the products. And then we would always say previous value plus products.quantity. Uh, and we would start at zero. So that would sum up all 
the product quantities. Quant I feel like I made a spelling typo at some point. This should be quantity. Oh no, where did I mess this up? Where did I mess up the quantity? Uh, not in here, not in my type. No, uh, quantity. Where did I mess up the quantity? Um, products, that should be in the used card store, shouldn't it? Uh, 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 products, products, oh yeah, here. Must be up here, exactly. Okay, um, so that means I might have to fix this in a few places. Okay, anything else in here that's wrong? Um, oh no, what did it just change? Uh, products and quantity, uh, quantity, oh man. I should really do a search for the wrong word. Uh, how did I misspell it? Quantity, quantity, <laughs> where did I misspell this? Uh, kunati, okay, yeah, kunati, yeah, kunati, <laughs> how can you misspell a word so hard? Uh, okay, yeah, it happens here as well, and in this place, and in this place. I hope you didn't use the wrong word. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're really using the right one. So, um, by the way, I'm able to open my card model. Cool, cool story, bro. Um, and we still have the zero. But now we do get that new value, and we can update the count correctly using the quantity. So, let's do a refresh here. And I'm able to add something and you see up there the number is just counting up because we can easily use our store from wherever we want. Now what I also want is to style this a bit nicer. So on my product stack I'm going to include a uh, style sheet here, style sheet from React Native. And I'm going to give the touchable opacity the style uh, styles dot count container. Um, or should I give this, I think I should probably better give this to my view. And the text will get the styles.count text. And as a result, uh, we have this. Um, do we also want an Ionicon? Yeah. Ionicon's name card size should be, in this case, oh, maybe a bit bigger, like 28. And we can probably just use mm, black on it, yeah. And as a result, we have a card up there that automatically updates whenever we put something in it. And that's, my friend, how you use Zustand for state management with a card in your e-commerce application. Great! Uh, that means we have pretty much finished everything that we want. The only problem here is that TypeScript is not happy. Um, we can solve that by adding another type. So up here where we already had our types, we can also add a stack navigation using the general navigation prop and passing in our product stack param list. And if we now use the stack navigation here for the use navigation hook, uh, then everyone is happy as we define this correctly. Cool. So we arrive on the modal page, which is sadly the last page of this full stack tutorial that we want to cover. I hope you already enjoyed this so far. Uh, leave a thumbs up if you came this far, because now the last thing is our card page. And it's just wrapping up everything that we had so far in that we want to display all the products from our Zustand store. And we want to have a button to finally submit that. And I will also install one additional package just for the fun, just having some fun in here. And that is going to be React Native Confetti Cannon. And you can already picture what we're going to do with that React Native Confetti Cannon uh, once we're done. So let's begin again with our Zustand. And I'm just going to bring this in because this is the same setup like we had before. We're just getting everything this time. We're getting everything because we need the products, we need the total price, we might want to on the fly change some products and we probably also want to clear the whole card after we are done. On top of that we of course need some styles. So const styles equals style sheet dot create. Uh, style sheet dot create. And we can wrap. Can this 
this should always start with like a container of, of flex one. <laughs> I feel like that should be the default setting for every screen. Um, and then we can also add, let's use a background color of white today uh, for this one screen. So background color white. Okay, cool. Uh, put the first style on the container, styles.container, and then we need to iterate the different items that we have on our page. So if we don't have an order yet, uh, we're gonna display all the different items that are currently in the cart. Um, we're gonna have to catch some state here as well. So I need to catch the email uh, because that is required to actually finish our um, our order. Remember when we two hours ago started with this, uh, we implemented that the user can just um, use an email and we can actually show this again. So this was back then in our server when we implemented the functionality to create a new order. We're right in the place. Uh, the user can add an email and an array of products in the body. So this is where the email comes from. Then once the order is created, uh, we're gonna set this here as well. Uh, this will help us to update the view and we're just gonna set this to null in the beginning. Uh, and this should actually have the type or can have the type order. I think we defined this or null. Okay, perfect. And yeah, not making more than it needs. And we might need navigation as well. So let's already add this navigation, use navigation. And this time we can already add the right type, stack navigation, and then we'll make it easier to use it. And finally, uh, do we want to use like a loading state of submitting? Uh, won't hurt. So let's use submitting, set submitting, and set that to use state false. Okay, that's the base for our page. Now, um, if we have an order, we're going to display this later, um, but we're going to start with a case that we don't have an order yet. So if we don't have an order yet, we would display everything and I want to display everything. Um, do we, yeah, let's just, let's just start with a view. I will just wrap this in a view for now and then we're gonna continue from there. So here we go. Uh, oh, come on, you could have left me a few brackets. That would have been easier. So text, style, uh, that should be the title. Uh, styles, let's give this card title. And this should say something like your cart. Okay, car title goes here. And I could use a font size of 20 or something. Um, here we go. Uh, on top of that, I might wanna put this in the center. So let's do it like this. Here we go, your cart up there, perfect. Um, below that, we are gonna show either if our products are empty. So if products.length is equal to zero, uh, we're gonna render a little text. Let's just render something like uh, your card is empty, just a little fallback message. And we're gonna also style this text align center. I don't need another class for this one. Okay, now it comes to rendering our actual items. Um, for that, I'm gonna use a flat list. Yeah, you could also use a flash list. Um, I mentioned this before. I right now don't want to use a flash list because then I have to create another build and uh, I just want to go with the easy way. Key extractor uh, should be what we had before. Um, we should get typings in here. Yes, item.id, but we're gonna have to use to string to satisfy this. And finally, uh, we need a render item function. Render item should go somewhere. And within here, we got access to the item and then we can render our item. Um, actually, I'm gonna use round brackets and um, yeah, I think we just need to put in some view then it should work out. Um, view. Yes, now everyone's happy. Okay, cool. Um, we probably also need like the card item container styling now. So this is one item. Uh, in our container, card item container. Uh, let's just render something in it. Let's just start with the image. So I'm gonna put this in. Uh, the image of course has its own class here. I'm gonna get to that in a second. For now, I just wanna see if we can 
correctly use this, just use the image from React Native, please. Mm. Oh yeah, the card item container also could need some styling. Um, but usually the card item container, it should work like this. Uh, is there anything in my, yeah, I think I have something in here. Uh, where's my view? Why is there nothing coming up? Uh, we have the container up here. We should have the products. Uh, why is nothing rendered? We have the products, render item. Let's give the card item container some some style. Oh, we do also haven't set the image. Uh, yeah, if we don't set the image with, we won't see anything. So now we got like little thumbnails of the images. And here are the different items that are currently in the card. Let's put something else in the card, like the send disk something. And if I go here, it appears up here as well. So this is the base now for our card. Additionally, for the container, I'm gonna give this a bit of margin and padding and gap between the different rows, but nothing too fancy. So with that in place, uh, let's put in the first part after the image, which is the information. Uh, about the item. So that would be the product name and the product price. And we're gonna use item container and card item name. Uh, so the item container will use the whole available space using flex one. Uh, and then for the actual uh, information, we're gonna use uh, just a little bit different font size. Okay, yeah, looks good. It looks good to me. So that is our information container. Now we need another row uh, with, uh, with buttons to reduce and add the quantity on the fly. We can just put it in here in another view. I'm gonna use the flex direction row for this view since we're gonna have the plus and the minus uh, and the quantity buttons in here. So I'm gonna add the touchable opacity and I'm gonna use the ionicons. And then we have the card item quantity styling, which I will put down here. So all of this is mostly just uh, UI stuff, like a bit of colors and a bit of margin and padding to make everything look better. So now we have the different quantities in here and we've once again connected our buttons to the reduce product or to the add product, which means I can on the fly update everything in here again, Zustan. So uh, Zustan. <laughs> Uh, so we got 19 items in here. Let's uh, reduce or add one and it's updated in here. Nothing we need to do because we're using the store. I really love Zustand uh, for all that we've seen so far. Um, now, finally, after our flat list, we can also render the total uh, money. So that should come after the flat list is done. Basically here, uh, we can render our total and let's use for total text a little bit of different background color. So it looks like this. Um, also, uh, the total should be automatically, yeah, the total is automatically updated uh, based on our Zustand. And we also see if I remove something that goes to zero, uh, not only the price changes, but the item is removed as well. This works just so good with Zustand, uh, I love it. Okay, next to this, we're gonna put a text input as we need to uh, also capture the information of the user, at least like the dummy information. So here is my little email input. And finally, we need a touchable opacity to actually submit our order. And I'm gonna put this below. Uh, so we're gonna have a submit button that looks just like this. Uh, again, this page is really heavily using CSS uh, to work correctly, but uh, is there anything wrong? Oh yeah, we don't have the on submit order. Uh, yeah, we can't, oh, oh, we haven't even defined like um, the API functionality for that. I mean, we have it on the express side, but we haven't added it on uh, our application. So we have the button here, which we can click. That should of course set our submitting state um, and then while we're submitting, it should say create order, otherwise submit order. And it will also be disabled while we're submitting the order. So we rushed a bit through the screen because there's really a lot of UI going on. You can once again, check out the code link below this video to see all of this. The most important piece is really that we once again use our Zustand uh, and the different functions to show all the products, to show 
Um, so basically this uh, are all the products. The total is displayed down here. Reduce product is used for minus, add is used for add, and clear card will be used once we submit the order. So then everything makes finally sense. Before we can do that, let's one last time jump back to the API. So when we create an order, we need to make pretty much the same request, uh, but this time we're making a post request and therefore set our content type to application JSON and include the order data here in the body. And because we initially set up the interface for the create order, we also know what we need to put in. So this is just the email and an array of product ID and quantity that will be submitted. Good. Um, now that we got this, I want to show you one more thing. And that is, um, I noticed a problem with this, especially on devices. So if we have more items, uh, let's add a bit more. I already got that one, not that one. So if I now go into this, my input field is covered by the keyboard, which is usually a problem. So I'm not 100% sure if this is still the best option. I read some threads that it's not the best, but in my case, the keyboard avoiding view still did its work. Um, to make it work, we're gonna set its style to flex one, so it's taking up all the space. And additionally, we need to pass in a little behavior. Um, this behavior usually looks like this. We're gonna check for the platform and if it's iOS, we're using petting and otherwise we're using hate. With that in place, we see, eh, I think it kind of already works pretty well now. Let's see. Yeah, I think that works. I think that works quite good. Um, I noticed some problems uh, initially. So if you want to, what you can add as well is the keyboard vertical offset. So that can change how far, for example, in my case, if I want to increase this as submit order is not fully visible, I would maybe set this to 75. And now the submit order is right in here. And if I would just, um, just for reference, if I set this to 25, see the difference? Now submit order is covered and I can't really get to it. So if you need better control over it, use keyboard vertical offset. And as you can see in my case, I'm now able to submit this in a better way um, as the button is always there and I can immediately click it. Okay, um, that's the keyboard avoiding view. And on submit order, we're gonna set submitting to true to disable my button. Um, just in case I will also call uh, keyboard dot dismiss because sometimes I'm just still in the field and notice that the keyboard stays open and I'm going to try and make my request to the API. So this will use create order and to create order, I'm going to pass in my email and for the products, we now use, uh, not just our products, because if we just pass in the products, it will complain as this is not the right way. Um, by the way, I'm going to set my order to the response here. That should actually work. Uh, yeah, that works. And I will also call clear card afterwards to clear the card after I started the order. And finally, just in case, I will set submitting to false. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we just need to transform the product that we have in Zustand to the correct interface that is required for create order. That means, let's do a quick map here. Uh, map, and for every product, we will return a new item that has a product ID using p.id, and that has a quantity of p.quantity. So we're basically omitting all the other values included uh, and only send the relevant stuff to our API. Good, I think we're mostly finished. Um, let's see, um, I think I'm actually able to submit this. Uh, let's maybe lock out my response. So uh, response and then let's give this a try. Let's hit submit and see. Uh, price was 900 something. Um, okay, card is now empty. Uh, I think my header should be in a different place. Yeah, <laughs> and header should be outside of not order. Uh, so I can still see this part. Your card is empty. And am I able to see my order? So the response, I think the order number was two. 
Um, oh, and we haven't implemented the functionality to oh yeah, the functionality get orders. No, but we can just check inside my Neon database. No big deal. So let's go to my database, two orders, and there should be an order to yeah, assassins and my total value. And of course, the items should also be included in the order items assigned to order two. So we have already achieved everything that we wanted. We can make our order. We have two stand. Uh, we have a full stack application. Let's just do one final thing. Um, and that is once we have the order, uh, I'm gonna show some cool stuff. So I'm gonna put this up here and now we're finally making use of the confetti cannon that we <laughs> installed before. So I quickly teased this. Uh, we have a confetti cannon with 200 uh, elements, a little origin, fall speed, fade out, auto store, nothing too fancy. And below I also present the information about the order uh, with some inline styling. So I didn't wanna create more styling, uh, this is just additional stuff on top because usually you will handle your order differently. So let's see, we have two items, let's say price for them is about $80. I'm gonna say test, I'm gonna submit the order. It's creating the order and our order is submitted with the order ID three, the card is empty and I can continue shopping which brings me back here. And if I check out my Neon console, uh, I should for sure find the order items for order number three. Uh, here we go, test and the total and all the items included. And once again, the cool thing is that if I now wanted to switch how the application works or I wanna test with a different data set, I could just create a branch from here um, or in my case, what I could do is I already created the different environments. So let's say I wanna npm run start prod. Now we're running in production mode. We're using a different environment. Um, if I just reload my application now, it should get a totally different data set. Uh, we're now getting 20 elements as we're accessing the different branch in Neon. And that means I can also buy different items, a jacket and this Samsung Galaxy monitor. Um, gonna use branched in here, submit that order. And that should most likely be order number one. And I can now go to Neon, switch my branch to the Jolly Wildflower one more time. And I would see the new order in here with my branched email. So immediately I'm able to switch between the different branches of my Neon database using our um, backend and the different uh, environments that we defined initially. And I think with that, we have finished everything that I want to show you today in today's e-commerce full stack tutorial. All right, and that's it for today. I hope you follow through with the whole tutorial because I think this is a great experience of setting everything up, including the Neon Postgres database, how we can define our tables with Drizzle, um, how we can include SQL data, how we expose this and build the REST API, and then of course, how we consume everything from the React Native side, including state management with Sustand, which is pretty easy to use in our application without any context or any crazy stuff going on after the initial setup. If you enjoyed this, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more and bigger builds coming in the future. And of course, support today's sponsor, Neon Tech. You can get started for free. Go check it out. You can easily plug it into your application. You can branch, you can use the CLI. And I highly enjoyed working with Neon as the database for my project. If you also want to learn more React Native, of course, check out my platform from galaxies.dev and I will hopefully catch you in the next video. So until then, happy coding, Simon.